to DC today. It is Tuesday, uh, August 8th, and uh, Brian Seitel here with you. Go through the markets and what I thought would be kind of a quiet day just early this morning before the markets looking over the economic calendar ended up actually having some action to it. So I hope you like the, the write-up I did and then we can kind of go through the action on the day. Markets traded off lower right away. The futures were down, so so I sort of knew that it was going to be a little lower day. But um, we traded as low as about 450 points by about 11 o'clock or so Eastern. So it was a decent down day. Obviously, we had an up day yesterday, so it was giving back what we what we had gotten the day before. Um, but for the rest of the day, we basically traded higher, and we slowly, steadily just kind of climbed out of it, regained almost two-thirds of that drawdown, uh, 300 points or so. We ended up closing down. 158 points on the day. The um, 10 year was lower by six basis points. It was, um, we, bonds had rallied a little more earlier in the day and, and came off that a little bit. So a little bit lower rates across the curve on the day. Um, the big news, which um, I think is what drew down markets initially, was a downgrade by uh, Moody's, which is a credit rating agency, um, just like Fitch is. And Fitch downgraded the US debt. Uh, last week, a uh, week ago today. So I, uh, I'm i sure this wasn't the reason, but it just sort of felt like they missed out on the downgrade party and wanted to, to jump on that train. So they downgraded part of the banking sy sy uh, sector. So this is the small and mid-sized uh, banks. Uh, there was 10 of them, um, and those were down. They traded lower on the day. They basically were citing things like higher funding costs, higher interest rates, you know, you know potential economic slowdown, and then exposure to commercial real estate. Well, all that's been pretty known. In fact, it was known, especially several months ago when we had actual bank failures in that sector with First Republic and then, sorry, with Silicon Valley Bank and then First Republic. So all of the info is known. Pretty much no interest rates are high and commercial real estate has come down a little bit. So um, I felt it was a bit behind the curve to downgrade them at this point, but, but so, so be it. They did give a negative issue and uh, some credit warnings on some of the big banks. So this is stuff like U.S. Bank Corp., Northern Trust, State Street. Um, so that's more meaningful if they actually go through and, and end up downgrading some of those banks. You could see um, you know, higher capital requirements and different things that could come to fruition there. But we'll take that as it comes. Um, China had some pretty significantly lower trade data on the day. They saw uh, imports, which is a reflection of domestic demand in the country, drop 12.4% um, from, uh, from last year. So, uh, and that's for the month of uh, 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 July. So pretty big drop um, on imports. And as China sort of is trying to get their local economy, their domestic economy to be a consumption-based economy, similar to what the U.S. has, where 70% of of our GDP comes from consumption. That's their shift and that's their aim and they've been stimulating and, and building and, and, and hopes to do that. It hasn't fully played out that way yet. It's still trying to you know wean itself off of, of being an export country. So the export figures out of China were what was more notable because they were down 14.5% um, and that's a big drawdown. It's basically the same amount um, or the last time it was that significant was right during the pandemic in February of 2020. Um, so, you know, shifting global demand and policy changes in the West of that drawdown in, in, uh, in exports, the U.S. and Europe was a big, bigger uh, contributor to it. So, you know, some of those Western policies and shifting supply chains and things. And, and those aren't really transitory deals. Like w once you start moving plants and producing things elsewhere, it, it's not so quick to, to just move it back. Um, so I think China is sort of feeling that. Uh, on both sides of it. So they have a, a slowdown. The, there was news out on Financial Times um, a couple of days ago that the local, the local government, so, um, uh, you know, Beijing basically was trying to curtail the negative talk on their economy. And so I think that it's real if that's happening, if they're, if they're trying to do something like that. And, um, but all that to say, uh, look, we're still talking about an $80 billion surplus for the month you know, in China. So it, it's, it's still the second largest economy in the world. It's incredibly important. But when you see slowdowns like that and, and anemic recovery post pandemic, it, it speaks to lower inflation, at least there. In fact, you know, disinflation significantly. 
they've let their currency get a little weaker too. And um, I suspect that's to try to boost exports. Um, so we'll see over time there. Um, the uh, deficit in the U.S. was also out today, and we actually came in about 4%, which is great. We're still at $65.5 billion for the month. But um, the deficit with China specifically was lower by about $2.1 billion at about $22.8 billion total. So, um, again, you're seeing some shift in policy there. You know, that deficit has come in. We're, last year, we were at $216 billion as of this date through a little more than halfway through the year. And now this year we're at about 142 billion as a deficit just with the country of China. So, so those things are shifting, um, and we're seeing that in the numbers. Um, there was a couple of Fed presidents talking today. Um, the uh, Philadelphia Fed president Harker, um, who is a voting member in the FOMC, so his words are, are taken um, as important as they are, was saying, you know, barring some other significant change in, in data that um, that he thinks pausing here, it makes sense. And we'll kind of let things play out with the rate policy that they've set. And they're already seeing a, a meaningful drawdown in inflation. And so that was deemed as a feather in the cap for the, the soft landing folks. And actually, some of those comments did come out when markets started to recover on the day, um, because also there was a, the Richmond Fed president, uh, Barkin, said basically the exact same thing that um, so long as nothing changes, they're, they're all good to, to keep it as a pause. Williams was out yesterday, another Fed president, and said the same thing. So there's an 88% chance as of today. I think it was 84% yesterday. So we're inching towards 100, but we're at an 88% chance that they're sort of done with rate, rate uh, hikes uh, from here. So um, there's a CPI number on Thursday which we wrote about a little bit, and that'll be looked at a lot. That's for the month of July. And uh, it may take up a small amount. I think 3.2 is what's expected year over year. Um, but uh, barring that changing, and then there's a PPI number on Friday. Um, if those things sort of come in line, then um, then I think, I think you know, those chances of a Fed pause will stay there. And I think that's what ultimately will happen. But all that to say, it was uh, a down day, but not so bad. Obviously, yesterday was an up day. Um, some data, but not a lot. Tomorrow, there's not a lot of economic data that comes out. Um, so we'll see what goes on in the trading day. But uh, do reach out with questions. Love to hear from you. Love to answer those questions anytime. And uh, with that, I shall let you go and enjoy your evening. Thank you for listening to DC Today. Mm -hmm.